need the anatomy to uh, succeed in regional anesthesia, especially if we are uh, considering our sonomorphological knowledge and our topographical knowledge. And as I said, you have individual sonar anatomy and anatomy as two bodies are not the same. And you see that very clearly if you put your transducer on two different people and you have two different images. Now let's talk about, uh, about the nerves. Typical pictures of nerves. And what I want to demonstrate with those four uh, images is how different nerves look as far as shape and echogenicity is concerned, but they do not differ as far as uh, pattern is concerned. And if we are approaching spine and paravertebral spaces, we have to underline the importance of knowledge of bone surfaces because these are really, really good landmarks, whatever you do if you're doing spine-associated sonography. For example, if you have a look at this beautiful image upper right, you see the cervical spine from ventral, and you get a clear image of bone surfaces. Uh, if you do scan it at the right position, for example, you go over the body and transverse processes of cervical spine. You do a longitudinal scan, you can see the body, you can see discs, intervertebral discs, etc. Or if you go paravertebral between transverse processes, you may have a look into the intertransverse space or window, acoustic window, ideal for a paravertebral approach. So, let's go to trunk. Trunk is our topic at the moment. And again, same thing as I did yesterday, keep in mind variability whenever you do scan uh, whatever sort of people and part of the body. The first topographical region we are dealing about now is the supra um, clavicular fossa or subclavian triangle. And there we're going for the brachial plexus. And you all know the brachial plexus is very packed at that uh, location on, f on top of the first rib. And this is a beautiful image where you see the first rib and acoustic shadowing. You see pleura once medial, pleura once lateral, and everything is packed right next to the subclavian artery. And this is something you have to keep in mind. Many individuals will have a huge vessel going through that, which does not hinder your block, but you have to adjust the distance from the clavicle. You just move a little bit more cranial, and that's it. But be aware of such huge vessels. In this case, that's the, that's the dorsal scapular artery. And about 50% to two-thirds of the population have that artery at that location. That means it pierces the plexus, so be aware of that. That's the whole package of nerves, bunch of grapes, as you know. And this is an easy situation, and here you adapt according to uh, the course of that artery. And I have to underline that this artery is not a variation. It's pretty normal. But in some individuals, it's very, very big, very, very big. So if you go to the trunk from posterior, we are approaching the intercoastal area. And there is a clear difference between medial or lateral to coastal angles because our window and image uh, possibility of nerves is quite different. So if you, it comes to the coastal angle and you go lateral to the coastal angle, you have beautifully uh, layers of muscles, external, internal, uh, intercoastal muscles, but you do not see the nerve between the ribs because it's on the uh, inferior border of the upper rib of an intercoastal space. So you will not succeed in visualizing nerve. Quite the contrast. If you go medial to the coastal angle, you see one layer of muscles, you see ribs with a typical acoustic shadowing, you see the pleura, and you have a beautiful image of the intercoastal nerve in that location. But you have to keep in mind, there's no safety barrier to the front because you have no uh, muscular layer in the deep. There's only one muscular layer, which is the external intercoastal, quite in contrast to the lateral location. So keep that in mind. If you go there, there's the pleura is very, very near, nearer than if you're lateral. And if we talk about intercoastal, more important for regional anesthesia purposes, of course, are the intercoastal nerves in the, in the abdominal wall. You all know that this is the plane where you go for the tap block, transversus abdominis plane block. You see how beautiful the nerves are distributed here. And it is on top, topographically speaking, of uh, transversus abdominis and deep to uh, external the oblique muscle of the abdomen. So external oblique, internal oblique, and transverse abdominis muscle. This is where we go for the tap lock. And we can go there very elegantly, very elegantly, also without seeing the nerves, not 
not necessarily possible. Another thing is the rectus abdominis, and quite in contrast to the lateral side, you see here, there's only one muscle you have to pull apart to go into the posterior area of the rectus sheath, and you see the intercostal nerves. They're uh, end part, of course, within the rectus sheath. And you have to keep in mind, uh, below the umbilicus, there is no aponeurotic sheath posterior. So if you're below the umbilicus, there's only a fascia transversalis. Something very similar to the intercoastal area where you have no barrier to the deep. So aponeurotic and just fascial layer if you're uh, inferior to the umbilicus. If you do a cross section through a body, as indicated here, you will get that image. And this is the way you go for a tap block between transverse abdominis and obliquus internus abdominis. Very interesting. Beautifully seen here in this individual, and this is very often the case. The internal oblique is, in many, many cases, the thickest of all that, and the transverse abdominis is the thinnest of all those three muscular layers. So external, internal, transverse oblique, uh, abdominis, transverse abdominis, and in between EOM, IOM, and TAM, you have the layer where you go for the tap block. In some individuals, you will see the nerves clearly, in others you don't, which is not the primary target, but you see the, how we could approach this uh, fa fascia layer. It's nothing else than a fascia layer. Rectus abdominis, you have two options, either out of plane or in plane, but the important thing is that you go to the posterior surface of the rectus abdominis. A beautiful picture in ultrasound scene here, and you see this is the area where you approach, and here is abdomen with uh, uh, peritoneum. And in this individual, because it was a slim um, individual and high-frequency transducers used, you see a beautiful image of those tiny little small nerves. Everything is possible if you have ideal patients. Nothing is possible if you have it the other way around. <laughs> So, two options, whatever you use, it's okay, and it depends, of course, on your skills. If you go out of plane, you have to do hydrodissection, of course, because the first thing that could happen if you're here is intramuscular injection, but don't go too deep, please. So, ilioinguinal and iliohypogastric nerves, there's one thing very, very comfortable about those two nerves. They are in the same plane as the tap block, that means... You use, again, the transverse abdominis muscle and the internal oblique, but you go away from the aces. You go, you go posterior and cranial to it, and then you have the nerves in the same layer. And ilioinguinal and iliohypogastric nerves, it's nothing else than a continuation of intercostals, and that is the topographical background. And additionally, in that location, which is approximately three finger breadths cranial and posterior to the aces, uh, the, the position of that nerves is very constant, very constant quite in contrast to the situation at the ACES. That means, in many, many cases, we see the nerves in contrast to the tap block. We see those two nerves. Keep in mind, some people will have only one nerve at that location. That means a common trunk for both. They split afterwards. So it's a good thing to get two nerves with one injection. And you see that with ultrasound. So don't go at the ACES. You go up and posterior. That means uh, variability is less. That was our question when we did our first study on that. And we are going upwards and posterior. This is the ideal location for the ilioinguinal iliohypogastric nerve block. Don't go too far posterior, otherwise you will miss the ilioinguinal nerve. And I'll explain that to you why. This is a beautiful image. See the iliac crest. It's not the aces. And you have always have you have to have this uh, landmark in your image. So if you don't see the bone as a landmark, you're too far medial because the ilioinguinal nerve seen here is very close, very close to the iliac crest. A nerve that is in that distance to the iliac crest is never the ilioinguinal nerve. It's always the iliohypogastric nerve. So some people make the mistake. They visualize the iliohypogastric and a second one, which is more medial, and they believe that's the iliohypogastric. It's not. It's the subcoastal. So these two nerves are in a clear layer, again, between internal oblique and transverse abdominis muscle. So it's an easy block, and in many cases, even in fat people, you see those nerves if you use the right transducer, which is the next problem. Uh, people always think they have to use high-frequency transducers to visualize those nerves, which is not really true. It's better to use other transducers and try to find those nerves um, the same way. And now we move to the spine. It's our, our next topic. 
divided in cervical, thoracic, lumbar, and sacral. And I will just point out the sonoanatomic background that is useful for original, not for other purposes. We do that in musculoskeletal, we do that in pain, etc., etc. So I will concentrate on uh, regional anesthesia. Something that is important, if you have a look at the acoustic windows you may use to go into the epidural space, that differs between individuals according to the bone shape, etc., and according to the situation of the articulations, the superficial joints. Because if you have alterations there and you have a shrinking of um, distances between um, arches, your acoustic window is definitely small compared to the situation here where there's no change in articular uh, situation. So always keep in mind if you have a sort of pathology not associated with your uh, uh, topic, but for example, uh, people very old, rheumatoid arthritis, etc., etc., you have to take that into account. And in the thoracic region, you have ligamenta flavor, very often ossified. So this may be a problem if you go to the epidural space in the thoracic area. And the anatomical background is as follows. If you have the cervical, thoracic, and lumbar vertebra, the what I call interarticular notch between articular processes is very different from cervical over thoracic to lumbar. And this dramatically influences your possible approach to the epidural space. And do not forget that the whole area between two spinous processes is filled with ligamentous stuff. It's interligament, interspinous and supraspinous ligaments. By the way, these ligaments, because they are so, so strong, um, are responsible for artifacts that you create if you go between two spinous processes. And you will see shadowing, acoustic shadowing, not quite as um, severe as with bone, but relevant. And if you're interested, you can hear that in my lecture on the spinous ligaments this afternoon. So this is the ligamentum flavum, and you see it very beautifully here. There's really thick thing, and it's bound between laminae of two adjacent vertebrae. And do not forget the interspinous ligaments, because they are, they, these ligaments are in your way if you would choose a median approach, quite in contrast to a paramedian approach, which is the most appropriate. appropriate. In the cervical spine, you have the orientation of uh, occiput, atlas, and axis. Very beautifully, the first spinous process that is bifid, having a left and a right tubercle, is the axis. And this is um, easily uh, distinguishable between atlas and axis if you have a look at the ultrasound images. So the first one being bifid is axis, and now you know the height. Turn your transducer and you can go for windows between uh, Oxibut, atlas, atlas, axis, and of course you can visualize all the surfaces of the uh, cervical spine. So there's almost no limits as far as the posterior and lateral side is concerned. There's only limits uh, from the ventral side if you want to go to the spine due to the airways. So that way you see the articular pillars also. And the vertebral canal is best approached if you start from the occiput going downwards. You see occipital bone, you see the atlas posterior arch, see occipital, the atlanto-occipital membrane and the first of our ligamentum flavum. This is a paramedian approach, as you may see, and this bony contour seen here is the right tubercle of the bifid spinous process of axis. That way, you can see the yellow ligament or ligamentum flavum, the epidural space, and the posterior dura. In many individuals, the best acoustic window is between occiput, atlas, and atlas and axis, especially if you move your head and uh, forwards and open that acoustic windows. In others, you could do beautiful images in a, a little bit oblique uh, area, and you can also go into the uh, vertebral canal area, visualizing the spinal cord, for example. But, as I said before, not all, all of your patients will have that beautiful uh, spines. So, if you have a spine like that, it gets very, very difficult, and you have images like that, or black. You don't see anything. So, always keep that in mind. And, if you go to the thoracic area, there's one thing which is very important to mention, is the width of the, lam of the laminae is much more than the width of the vertebral body. That means, just due to very easy anatomical reasons, you have no chance in the thoracic spine to go near to the intervertebral foramen. No chance. Ultrasonographically, you don't see anything. So, 
Same applies if you're in the middle part of the spine, of the thoracic spine, and want to go median. You will not succeed. Obviously because of the skeleton. If you go paramedian, that's very different. And it very much depends on the part of this thoracic spine, if you're up, middle, or down there. And one thing I try to point out also is if you're doing in the middle part of the spine a transverse scan, you have a beautiful image of surface of transverse processes and the spinous process, but the spinous process you image in that transverse uh, level is not the spinous process of the same transverse process. Okay? That's because of the, uh, uh, the architecture of the spine in the middle area, uh, thoracic spine. So, one thing is also, uh, um, I have to mention also, is the fact if you're going down to the lumbar spine, like 11, 12, transition zone, the distance between spinous process and transverse process will be very, very small because those vertebrae are more or less looking quite similar to lumbar vertebrae. So it is a difference if you do it up, middle, or lower part of the thoracic spine. Fortunately, we can go to the canal if there are no, no uh, osseous uh, barriers. For example, between 11 and 12, you get beautiful images of the um, spinal canal, like having, again, the ligamentum flavum, epidural space, dura posterior, dura uh, dura posterior and dura anterior. And in some instances you will also see the posterior longitudinal ligament. But it all depends on the width of the window you have. And the same is true if you're going up there, like from TH1 to TH4-5, you have acoustic windows easily accessible and you may visualize the same thing. If you compare those two pictures, there's not much difference. It's just because of the fact that the acoustic windows are there, quite in contrast to the middle part. Again, the same thing, like having the ligamentum flavor, epidural space, posterior dura, spinal cord, and anterior dura. And please keep in mind, this is a pretty normal uh, spine you see on the right-hand side. The spinous processes will not point directly posterior. And this is pretty normal. That means if you palpate two spinous processes, the does not mean that you're right in the middle of the, of the body or in the, median, in the median area. And as I always um, point out, a lot of uh, barriers may be there, like ossification of the yellow ligaments or ligamentum flavum. It gets easier if you come to the lumbar spine. Why? Because quite in contrast to the thoracic area, you have the laminae, which are very, very slim, and you have bodies which are really, really broad and wide. So it's the other way around that means better situation for visualizing, um, for example, the area of the intervertebral foramen, uh, posterior aspects of the intervertebral discs and bodies. This is possible lumbar. So much more seen, just the most ventral part of the lumbar spine will not be accessible uh, with ultrasound. Putting your transducer more laterally in many individuals, it's also um, possible to visualize the aorta or the inferior vena cava very much in contrast to the thoracic area. And in some individuals, you will have space enough if you go median to the epidural area, but you have to recognize that this is also something pretty normal. So a drop-like extension of the spinous process, and then your, your uh, acoustic window will be very, very narrow if you come from posterior. So the solution is very easy. You go paramedian and solve this problem. And do not forget... This is the lower doses of spine, 5, 4, 3, 2, and you have no chance to go there if you have uh, a severe lower doses that you cannot overcome. Some people will not have the chance to get uh, rid of that lower doses, whatever you're trying to do. So, median approach, not good, because you don't see anything in the deep. And you see sp spinous ligaments in between, but only the superficial part. And I will come to that, as I said, in the afternoon, if you're interested. Paramedian, many, many individuals will let you sh uh, have a look into the epidural space. Like, again, the ligamentum flavum, which is very strong and very thick in the lumbar area. You see the difference to the thoracic, very double layer. Epidural space, dorsal dura, and ventral aspect of the vertebral canal. And in some individuals, you will have all those structures very sharp and one image. This is not the rule. It's more the exception. So you have the 
uh, ligamentum flavum, epidural space, dura, and you see parts of the corda equina, you see anterior dura, and you see posterior longitudinal ligament. That's a question of, of angulation and physics, etc., etc. So don't expect that you see all those things at the same time very sharp. It's just a rule and fact. And the last of our ligamentum flavum between S and L5 is the strongest. Very easy, explainable to, to mechanical reasons because it's the most loaded. So this is regularly very, very beautifully seen. And what I did here, you probably recognize that, I concentrated on the ligament. What's the consequence? I concentrated on the ligament. The deeper part is not that good. That's a message you should take home. Don't try to visualize things that are not possible in one instance. Okay, last but not least, we're going to the sacrum, the sacral area. And don't forget the sacrum belongs to the spine. And fortunately, it's rather superficial. That means the dorsal surface of the sacrum is really beautifully seen in the ultrasound. Uh, but there are a lot of things posterior to uh, that sacral bone, which is ligaments, ligaments, and ligaments. And of course, you have clear orientation, for example, by the dorsal sacral foramina, but they are covered with thick ligaments, you have to know that, and this all will be seen in the ultrasound image. And one thing also important is the sacral hiatus, which is completely covered by a membrane. You either call it sacral coxygeal membrane or sacral coxygeal posterior ligament, blah, blah, blah. There are a lot of those ligaments. Important for you is that the hiatus is closed. That means you see that in ultrasound and can go through that membrane or whatsoever. Clearly seen here, this is the last of our um, spinous processes of the sacrum, which is the median sacral crest. Don't forget that it's four, it's not five, because the last will not fuse in many, many individuals. And in some individuals, it's even at level of three, that means the hiatus is very high. That means if you go caudal, you may reach the dural sac very, very easily. So we have to do a a really um, good survey of your posterior surface of the sacrum. Because if you have a, a really, really uh, um, short median sacral crest, you may come into problems if you go into the epidural space. And this is pretty normal variability. And you can do it in the transverse can also, seeing the membrane very beautifully here. And the sacral horns, hiatus, uh, borders to the hiatus. But Keep in mind again, this is just a few examples what the sacral hiatus may look like, and you may recognize that it's pretty different in individuals, so keep that in mind. And of course you all see that if you use ultrasound in that area. In paravertebral regions, we start with the vertebral scalene triangle, a very important thing between longus coli, anterior scalene muscle, and uh, um, pleural dome, and don't forget that the inferior roots of the brachial plexus, like TH1 and C8, C8, they are traveling through that topographic area before they reach the intervertebral space. You have to know that, because here it's dangerous and here it is not. And, of course, don't forget about the vertebral artery that covers part of our uh, cervical sympathetic trunk, in, in especially the stellate ganglion, the inferior cervical ganglion, and the inferior part of the uh, trunk. This is a magnification trying to show you one uh, important variant. This is the lateral border of the anterior scalene, and you see one big vessel, which is a variation here because it's far medial. The offspring is far medial, and then you can come across with that if you do an interscalene space, uh, interscalene block. And again, have a look at the roots C8 and TH is even coming from posterior. That means TH1 is located posterior to the pleura, not on top. And C8 is on top of the pleura. Just to underline how near you are to the important and vital things. This is the image where you see one of those arteries. And it looks quite the same as all those other black bubbles. So keep that in mind. The roots of the cervical area, they're accessible, easy accessible. For example, C7. You recognize this is 7 because there's no anterior tubercle, very close to the vertebral artery. And you may even follow those things longitudinal. Try that. It's worth doing that because it's a clear border and you clearly see the epineurium, which in many people is nothing else as a, as a far protrusion laterally of the dura. And a lot of people have those protrusions. So be aware of that and be careful because it's very vulnerable. 
If you go for the transverse processes, scanning the vertebral artery, you can also see uh, the roots lying posterior to that artery. In the thoracic area, you have a part of vertebral space either accessible between transverse processes or a bit more laterally, the medium-most part of the intercoastal space. This is the typical picture of the um, coastal, uh, superior coastal transverse ligament. It's a little bit, a little bit obliquely orientated, and you see the paravertebral space, and that's the pleura. The same thing as I explained to you in the lumbar area. Don't expect that you see all those structures very sharp at the same time. So we have to do a little bit of uh, sophisticated scanning. And this is one possible approach the medial most part to the paravertebral space, I have to underline this is not paravertebral, that's intercoastal. And I would not go as people do in plane and come, go underneath the transverse process and you don't see your needle. If you go out of plane, it's no problem. Lumbar spine, paravertebral space, the last thing we'll cover, that's psoas major and important vessels are within the psoas, which is the assembling, uh, ascending lumbar vein, you see the, break, uh, the lumbar plexus, and again, underline the importance of the uh, bony surfaces. Again, you won't have those beautiful images all the way. In some people, it's even impossible to do that. But quite in contrary to the thoracic area, you see the area of the intervertebral frame, and you even see parts of the intervertebral disc and body. But not in this case. Even if you use best technology and best anatomical knowledge, this is probably the picture you will get. And I hope you don't see anything. That was it. I really like to thank you for your kind attention and don't forget that you use anatomy in the right way and apply it to your day.